Tim is wearing sensors. So recording from my ear, brain activity, and we're recording heart rate and we're recording movement from the chest. We're streaming this to the cloud, where we're translating this into measures of my relaxation level, my heart rate, we can get heart rate variability, we can get a variety of states that are related to the types of signals that I can get here from this in-ear sensor and from my heart rate monitor. And all that happening in the cloud and coming back to my uh -huh. mobile device. So we've got our EEG, our ECG, our heart activity, my relaxation score, actigraphy, so if I move around a little bit, it's going to go up, it gets all red, and now I'll be still, and, and then great. my heart rate. And so we can take all of this and we can do something kind of cool like this because all my data is going through Neuroscale. Hey Alexa, ask Neuroscale for my current relaxation level. Your current relaxation level is 20%. You're pretty pumped up. If you feel like relaxing a bit, we could do some meditation exercises together. And that's an example of how we can integrate something like Amazon Alexa through the Neuroscale platform, connect that to my brain and my heart, my body, do something useful like asking Alexa, what's my state? How am I feeling right now? But it could also be your light, it could be your car, it could be any other internet connected device. And you can build that kind of application um, on the Neuroscale platform. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are at the Transformative Technologies Conference. It is super fun here. And we have an awesome guest joining us for this episode. I'm really excited. We have the Tim Mullen, the Dr. Tim Mullen joining us. <laughs> hey man. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on the show. Yes, sir. Really appreciate it. And the CEO of Intheon, and Intheon, Neurotech Anytime, Anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I will, we'll, let's, we'll unpack how you're doing that and I will get there. I wanna know who you are first and how you got to where you're at. How did that even happen? How did you become <laughs> passionate about this? Well, I was born I was and born. then I ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wasn't just born yesterday, but, um, but I am a computational neuroscientist by training, my academic training was uh, first at Berkeley. I was a computer scientist back then. Uh, my interest was in artificial intelligence and I wanted to really build um, computers that could understand us. That was my goal. And through that process I started to get really interested in neuroscience um, because it seemed to me like this is the best example we have of a thinking thing that can understand and adapt to the world. And so the if we can understand this thing a little better, maybe we can build those thinking things a little better. And so um, I came through that process into computational neuroscience, which is what my PhD was in at UC San Diego, at the Institute for Neural Computation. And out nice. of that came Intheon, the company that uh, I'm currently uh, uh, leading and, um, and the amazing team that, um, that I have the fortune of working with there, uh, helping yeah. build technology for everybody, neurotechnology for everybody. <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay, so what does, you, 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 you give this really interesting thought is that you're, you, li you like brain, you like AI, you see AI, you want AI to be better and a good way to, for that to be better is to understand the brain. And then yes, the, so yes. that's one, but it's kind of a means to an end. You know, my, my goal and our goal at Intheon is to increase human potential, what, what humans are capable of. I see artificial intelligence as a extension of ourselves, of our biology, really, if you think about it. Yeah. Um, the computing technology to create are just an extension of ourselves. And its purpose, I hope, will be to increase our capabilities as humans to get, get, allow us to do things that we would not have been able to do before. Um, neurotechnology serves a similar purpose. It's, I think its ultimate purpose is to enhance our capabilities and take us to a new level and a new dimension of what humans are capable of. And that and AI together can play in a very synergistic way. Yeah, I, I love thinking about it as an extension uh, of our biology. And then there is a, there's this element to it that I think the way, the way you, you speak about it super like calmly and super, I think it's because you studied it so deeply, I think. Um, maybe, who knows, but the, uh, teach us a little bit about 
the computation and the neuroscience at the same time. Neuroscience is a lot of data. There's a lot of data, there's a lot of math, there's a lot of, of, of everything from brain waves to how often a neuron is firing, what neurotransmitter is being sent. There's, right. Yeah, so. The brain is very, very complicated. Um, as a neuroscientist, I can tell you confidently that uh, I don't understand how it works. <laughs> um, so we're none of us understand to, really yeah. how it works, but we understand some things about how it works. Um, we have models of the brain. Um, the famous statistician, uh, statisticians, Box and Jenkins, famously wrote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the, <laughs> and the practical question is how wrong do they have to be to not be useful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I like to think about it that way. We are fundamentally, everything we think we know about the brain is probably wrong. Our models are probably wrong, but some of these models are actually very useful. And so some of the challenges that we, we face in computational neuroscience and in neurocomputation in general is how do we take these signals, as you mentioned, a lot of data that we can record from the brain, from the body, also from movement, from the eyes, and then translate that into something that's meaningful and useful that tells us something about your state. And yes. there's, a, there's a lot of steps in that, which involve everything from taking those signals and removing all the noise. There's so much noise in the signal that's yeah. not related to those neurons firing your brain, which by the way, we can't see from outside the head, but we can get kind of a noisy chorus of activity. And then we gotta filter that activity and extract out from there the teeny little needle in the haystack that is the signal that is related to a particular state you're interested in measuring, like your yeah. emotion or frustration or something like that. Yes. And that's essentially what we do as computational neuroscientists, as, as machine learning enthusiasts and experts mm -hmm. to try to bring those things together and do that decoding. Yeah, the decoding, and then, mm -hmm. get, gosh, what, as you're talking about uh, so much noise, so little signal, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about Twitter and Facebook, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm thinking about all Somewhere in the Twitter stuff. sphere, there's a, a useful comment. comment. <laughs> but where is it? Yeah, where is it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah that same thing up here. So, okay, so so this is, this is really tough. How, okay, now, there's so many different methods to get the data that then has to be decoded into these uh, these emotion yeah yeah feeling um, now now the way that we get the data right now is mostly EEG fMRI mm -hmm. yeah so EEG fMRI are two tried and true methods for measuring brain activity um, but very different some methodologies. most of yours comes from um, EEG, far more than fMRI. Okay. And the main reason is that an fMRI machine costs, you know, anywhere from one to two million dollars to Damn. purchase, so I don't have one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, although, you know, we have access to them as scientists, then we can use them for our research, but it's not something you're going to just have an fMRI machine, you know, lying around, or MRI machine. It's an MRI machine, and we do functional MRI. Functional MRI. Um, but uh, uh, the other factor is it's also very expensive to maintain. Um, Second, or thirdly, um, it is not a mobile imaging technology. Totally. You can't walk, you're lying yeah. prone, you're inside a massive magnet with a yeah. superconducting sphere around it, you know, and uh, uh, it's, it's not something where you're gonna, it's gonna be useful in the workplace or in your car or anything like that. EEG, on the other hand, even though it's an older technology, well, you it's, know, older. Over, it's over 100 years old. No. Um, it is, yeah. Or, um, well, what? Uh, almost 100 years old, well, I should I've been say. Thinking <laughs> of that this Soon is it will like, be 100 years I've old. I've been thinking this is just 40, 50, something like no, that. No, 1930s, um, Damn. actually. And so, you know, it goes all the way, and actually, you know, the, it goes back further than that. That's when Hans Berger uh, first really wow. um, popularized the notion of the electroencephalograph. Yes. yes. And so, um, and some of the signals that he observed way back then, like the alpha rhythm, we're mm. still looking at today and still mm -hmm. proving useful. We're still understanding more about. Mm -hmm. That's how complicated mm -hmm. the brain is, you know. Um, you can spend many, many decades looking at a signal and you're still seeing new dimensions of how mm. that signal relates to behavior yeah. and to states. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but what's happened over that period of time between then and now is the technology has miniaturized, 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 and the computing capability has gone up. Mm -hmm. And we now can measure what, what would have occupied an entire room um, and had a lot of analog circuits and a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, hardware. Now it can all be miniaturized into a little chip that I can 
pop in my ear and measure my brain activity there, for instance, or put on my forehead like Interaxon today mm -hmm. was talking about their new device, which is just great uh, for measuring brain activity. And all these kinds of wearable EEG mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the big distinguishing factor between fMRI and EEG um, in terms of its utility. And can it get out there into the world get in out there into mobile the world. context and be, mobile. and be cheap, be cheap. cost effective, accessible, and scalable. Most of these devices are like $300 or they something. They can be any, an EEG device can range anywhere from uh, $50 to $15,000 okay. or more. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it all depends on the quality of the signal and how many sensors and all of that relates to how precisely you can image the brain with EEG, because you can actually image the brain with EEG like you can with, say, fMRI. These are also differences between the two technologies. So you can see into the brain, but also the kind of signal-to-noise characteristics. In other words, how yeah. well can I extract that needle in the haystack? And so fMRI um, makes it easier. It does make it easier to extract certain kinds of things. So if I want to know where a signal is coming from, or certain, so if I want to look at a specific area of your brain and say, is that area of the brain activated when you're doing task X? Yeah, yeah. With fMRI, I can have good spatial resolution. Yes. I can look at maybe about one millimeter wow. of, of your brain. With EEG, it's a fuzzy view. Maybe the best I can get is a centimeter yeah. to image that. And that's what sophisticated yeah. signal processing methods, yeah, yeah. sophisticated mathematics yeah. that let us try to look deeply inside the brain and try to and see where the signal is coming from. fMRI is looking at blood flow. It's movement. not really blood flow. It's what a deoxygenated hemoglobin and uh, de other stuff. But basically hemoglobin. what it's looking at is, okay. we can think of it as looking at um, resource consumption there, that's a good rather one. than the electrical activity directly. So when neurons ah. fire and they're active, they consume more Glucose resources. In this case, yes, and there's a, in, a oxygen. Genetics. So the oxygenated oxygen. hemoglobin uh, and deoxygenated hemoglobin ratio is different, different. when there's oh. more activity in a particular part of the brain. That's called the bold signal, but or it's an extraction of that. Cool. But cool. Um, you know, to be honest, and I'm not an expert with fMRI in totally. the same way that I know um, about EEG, um, but I, I can say I think pretty confidently that also there's a lot we don't quite understand about exactly what the mechanism is that is driving that particular signal. So then out of now with this r huge revolution of, of so just kind of, it's just following kind of Moore's law um, that we're having a significant amount of computational power for lower amounts of cost. We're able to wear it. We're able to walk around with it. We're able to sleep with it. We're able to, this is amazing. And so now you're getting tons and tons and tons of data. And then, so mo as a percentage, most of your data is from EEG. So a lot of our data is from EEG, but we also process data from all kinds of other sensors. So heart rate monitors. Oh, you do? Yeah, cool. eye tracking devices. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, if you have a sensor on your muscle recording your muscle act activity, we can make sense of that data too. Oh. Um, motion capture, accelerometers. So we think of this as a whole systems approach to understanding the state of a, of a person so that we can optimize that and improve it. And so the cool. brain is a big so part cool. of that, right? But the yeah. body is, actually the brain is part of the body, right? We often think of the brain and the body somehow like they're two separate things, <laughs> but, the, but it's all the body, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, the brain is a part of it. Um, and you need to look at it from this whole systems approach to really understand uh, what's going on, you know? Are, is different algorithms for being able to make signal from EEG than it is from muscle or heart rate. Or yeah, so there is there is some portion of the mathematics and the and the signal processing that translates across these, and there's others that don't. They and don't so know. there's uh, you know if I'm looking at your uh, movement activity, the patterns for pro the patterns of movement activity and how I process that data is going to be different than if I'm trying to image activity inside your brain. But upstream of all that, let's say I have a signal that is telling me how activated or how much ac activity there was in a particular part of your brain. It's a time series, okay? Some squiggly thing. Mm -hmm. And then I've got some signal telling me how much you moved or what your posture was at every moment in, the same, uh, in time. Two of these signals 
At that point now, it becomes a machine learning problem to say, how are these related and how do they predict your state? And that part cool. can be very similar for all these different domains. Yeah, the yeah. input can That's be similar, cool. it's just patterns. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I can take my favorite machine learning approach. Yeah. It could be anything from you know, your sparse logistic regression to your deep neural network to whatever you want, right? And I can take these machine learning techniques AI, as we're now mm -hmm. seem to be all colloquially calling it. <laughs> in other words, regression on a lot of data. <laughs> but uh, in any ways, um, and I'm a big AI fan. <laughs> but but uh, we're taking this this stuff, and now we're applying that to these kinds of signals. And we can take we can take the algorithms that Netflix, the types of algorithms Netflix uses to figure out, you know, what type of movie you like, and we can apply that to your bio signals to uh, uh, all, you know, those kinds of algorithms to figure out how you're feeling. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. So at that point, it doesn't relate so much to the sensor, uh, the signal type anymore, although there is yeah. some relationship. But yeah, it's yeah. upstream that it really matters. Yeah. And that's a lot of what we do at Intheon, is that we, we figure out how to take that stream and turn it into something yes, useful, yes, and then we yes, apply yes. machine learning on it. And yes. we give you back something very simple, like what is the state of, uh, of the person wearing the sensor uh, in real time. Yeah. Through the cloud. Uh, nice. Okay, so as long as the sensors are connected to the cloud and then you have an account with Intheon, then my data can real time be being processed by Intheon, giving me very close to real time results of my current physiology. Exactly. So my, my goal is to make it possible with as little as five lines of code for you to access a lab's worth of state-of-the-art analytics and signal processing to obtain a meaningful state, like for instance, what's your frustration state, or what's your emotional state, um, or your attentional state. And to be able to integrate then that signal in real time into any internet connected device or application. So I could have a little wearable on my wrist and a sensor on my head or someday in my brain, if, as we get to the point we can talk about implants if, if you want later. But um, I could have that little wearable that has almost no computational capability at all, tapping into almost limitless computational capability in the wow, cloud yeah. and telling yeah. me in real time what that state is. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's the power of uh, it's cloud a computation. It's a sensor going to cloud to the computation. Cloud which and has coming back to a device that allows me to act meaningfully really on that state. Or my car, for instance, another good example is that my car could be asking our cloud service, which is called Neuroscale, asking Neuroscale, what's the driver's mind wandering state right now? Is the yeah. driver focused or yeah. is the driver starting to drift away? Yeah. And it's just asking, you know, yeah. once a second or 10 times a second, what's that state? Yeah. And if I'm wearing a sensor, setting that data up, then we can do all the sophisticated computation and my car can now be aware of my state and then it can act proactively to increase safety by maybe taking over if it knows that I'm not capable of stopping in time if something happens. It can basically um, amp up its own automated AI system to basically yeah. say, hey, I gotta take the wheel for a bit here because yeah, yeah. you know Tim is yeah. not in a good state. <laughs> yeah, and then <clears throat> this is also very helpful for uh, emotion regulation. It could be. It, it could be. Where, where is it most helpful right now? So there's a whole emerging space um, of you know uh, what used to be called neurofeedback, but now it's kind of you know in the broader space of neuromodulation, closed loop neuromodulation. And the basic principle is that the brain is a plastic system, which means that it is adaptable. It's changing constantly based on inputs mm -hmm. and internal goals. Mm -hmm. And there's a reward system in the brain mm -hmm. that's constantly trying to shift and change how different areas of the brain wire up and talk to each other to optimize the desired outcome. And that's evolutionarily what the brain is essentially designed to do or has evolved to do. Um, and so if you can construct a system that can measure activity from a part of the brain, Let's say it's an area of the brain involved in, uh, you know, that might be related to, uh, to mood. And I can record activity from that area. And let's say increasing activity in that area of the brain is shown scientifically to increase my sense of well-being or my mood. Now, if I can measure that, that signal related to activity in that area and then feed that back into, maybe let's put it into a game where the only way I win the game 
is by increasing activity in that part of the brain. Mm. The brain will learn to increase activity in that part mm -hmm. of the brain. And we believe if you design this closed loop system in the right way, you can yeah. get that to be a, a permanent effect or at least a long lasting effect. Could and even Adam Ghazali uh, uh, has been working on this for a long time. We love The them. neurotherapeutic games, Good right? Friend, exactly. Yeah. Achilles Interactive, yeah. Exactly. And so Achilles is trying to do that with behavior, right? Yes, yes. But it can also extend into the neurospace, where at some point you're now directly reading from the brain and then you're adapting that circuit to improve mm -hmm. performance or, or achieve a desired outcome. Yeah. Another possibility is neurostimulation. So you could also stimulate the brain while yeah. after yeah, or yeah. while you're measuring it to try to, uh, to change those circuits. And the, uh, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about the absolute incredible benefits. I'm also thinking about what we've seen in the last 10 years with addiction to social media. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have to be very proactive in thinking about the future use cases of these technologies. And, you know, we shouldn't revert to Ludditism, which is to totally. say, totally. let's ban the technology. Totally. But we have to also not throw ourselves headlong and thoughtlessly into, you know, those domains without really thinking, okay, what are we doing? Why are we building this? Are we building the right thing? How are we using it? Um, and that's a social discourse, you know, a societal discourse. And it's, it's a global discourse that has to be carried out. Yes. And it is happening. Um, but it is very important, of course. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, the data that's coming in and making sense of the data that's coming in and what is the, <laughs> like as much as we can talk about it, because I know at some point you're going way over my head with actual computational neuroscience analysis, but so, okay, you're getting, you're getting this information that's coming in from, let's say, an EEG and that you are you're, I mean, it depends on where the EG is located on the person's head in mm -hmm. the first place, and then and then it depends on uh, how frequently they're sending you the readout of information, right? And then, right. Yeah, yeah, how many how many electrodes there are? Mm -hmm. yeah. All factors, absolutely, yeah. and how well we can decode a state. Mm -hmm. um, so, so th you know the. Uh, well, there wasn't exactly a question there, but the answer, if I was to pose an answer to Which the unstated I question, felt like you were going to, <laughs> yes, yes, would be that um, <laughs> that you're pointing out one of the big challenges of neurotechnology, which is that um, the design of the sensors and the hardware and where you put it and how you measure that signal and then what you do with it all um, allow us to achieve different levels of performance in decoding brain activity. And when you're trying to, um, say, build a device that addresses a particular, um, you know, uh, problem, and you need to know where do I put that sensor and how many sensors do I need and what type of algorithm do I use to do the decoding, all of that can be a massive research project that's very difficult to, uh, to undertake and can take you months or, or longer. Uh, years sometimes and a lot of expertise and resources. Now yeah. at Intheon, we've been working in this space for a long time, our team, so we have a pretty good understanding of where those, what kinds of sensors will be useful for decoding a certain kind of state and where you should put those kinds of sensors. And part of what we're doing by interfacing with many different sensor types and then having many different types of pipelines and algorithms you can apply to those and allowing you to quickly iterate by yeah. taking a sensor off the market and plugging it into this algorithm and testing it and within a week, mm. being able to say, oh, hey, did that work for me? Did that achieve the outcome I wanted for my product or my device, you know? And being able to measure that impact, you can very quickly iterate through that space to find what the right combination is of device and, and algorithm or pipeline for your specific application. And so that's one of the things that we're helping uh, to accelerate. Your training is, is models. Space. We're training models on, yeah, we are training, we are training models, we have models, we're training models on lots of different kinds of data um, and trying to understand how that data specifically relates to a, uh, a state um, of interest. Like for instance, let's say if we're just talking about emotion, you know, yeah. uh, one of those questions might be, do I need four sensors? Do I need 20 sensors? Do I need yeah. 64 sensors? Where and where do I put yeah. those, yeah. right? Some of these are unanswered questions. Do you have an idea? We're answering some of those questions. Well, there again, it depends on the yeah. type of application. So Within emotion, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I can tell you, for instance, if you have 
one sensor or two sensors, you're not going to get a reliable, well, two sensors is the minimum, you're not going to get a reliable measure. If you have 64 sensors, we can decode your emotional state uh, in certain contexts with, you know, about 76% accuracy or so in certain contexts. Damn. And then in between, there's a gradient, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, um, and that gradient is part of what we help when we work with companies more closely. We help them understand, okay, for this sensor, this type of algorithm or pipeline that we have is going to be useful for mm -hmm. you. But as our ecosystem continues to grow, we think we can automate all of this stuff where if you say, okay, I have a sensor of this type. Well, we know that that sensor of that type typically with this t pipeline will produce a good result for this particular application, like let's say for emotion. And then we can say, okay, well, the sensor that you have um, is not going to be useful for decoding emotion. You need at least this many sensors in this location. And with this pipeline and this algorithm, we can now reliably decode that emotional state. That comes out of having access to more and more data. Yeah. yeah. And what does it look like when you partner with neurotech companies and then their, their hardware is getting the data? And then how does that, how does that work? Um, so the way that our platform works is that you can kind of think of it as like, I don't know if you're familiar with Nuance. They, uh, you know, Dragonsoft, naturally speaking, became Nuance. But mm. basically it was a speech decoding mm. um, uh, 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 company um, that, in the, you know, through the 90s and into the aughts, um, uh, became a platform in the cloud where you basically use their API and you send it waveforms of your speech waveforms and it run, they run algorithms that they've now trained on tons of data and they provide back to you um, what the decoded you know, uh, speech is, the text, right? Mm -hmm. okay? And you basically pay for the use of that. Mm -hmm. um, our model is similar, but for biosensors. So you send it biosensor data. If you're a company and you want to yeah. work with us, you don't yeah. even have to partner with us. You could yeah. just use our API. Yes, yes. You literally just connect your sensor to our API, send us yeah. data, stream us data, choose what kind of uh, state you want decoded, and not all state decoding is possible with all types of sensors, and, but if presumably you have the right type of sensor, then uh, you can apply the, uh, the appropriate pipeline. And you get back, again through the API, uh, the interpreted um, uh, state. So if I want to measure, let's say again, something like, uh, let's, let's pick attention, your attentional state. Um, if we have an attention pipeline there on the cloud, then you get a sensor, you plug it in, you say I want to measure the person's attention once per second. And you simply, with a few lines of code in your app, you just ask the server, what's the attention state of the person right now? Mm -hmm. That's it, and mm -hmm. you just get that back as a number. Mm -hmm. All the rest of the machinery all happens on our end, and you don't, you know, you don't need to, to do anything more than just uh, send data through that API. As a developer, you can make the link to Intheon, and then the consumer makes the decision at when to actually make the calls for the. So the developer would build. Let's say that you're a developer building a app um, to measure attention. Right, you would build an app for your consumer, and your consumer and you as the developer, you as the developer for a company, uh, you know, have your consumer provider relationship. The consumer never talks to us. Um, yeah, consumer goes through you. Yes, yeah, so the consumer ping pull ping queries the developer. Uh, the, 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 the yeah, relationship the consumer basically that. just wears the device. Right, they use the app. As far as they know, they're using an app from, let's call them, you know, supercharged. Uh, interesting. Um, and they, th the consumer will never know. The about consumer will it. never know that cool. it's Intheon behind the scenes cool. powering it. So it's kind of like, uh, like Amazon Web Services. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Ninety percent of the time, you're, if you're using anything on the cloud, or not ninety percent, but you know, it's high, forty percent yeah. of the time, probably you're yeah. using it's Amazon high. Web Services. You might be using Azure. You might be using Google Cloud. Either way. You know that you're using this app, but behind the scenes, all the heavy lifting in terms of the, the um, uh, not necessarily the computation, but the computing infrastructure is being done there. Yeah. For us, it's all the intelligence of the decoding and making sense of those signals. That's all done by us behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. I, wanna, I still want to be walked through, if possible, if possible on your end, um, what it would be like to be wearing one of these, using a service, and I am measuring my emotional state or my attention state. We were saying attention state. So if I'm measuring my attention state and I want a, 
a ping? Is this, this is probably a pretty normal request, would be to get a ping when my mind has wandered for like five or ten minutes or something, when I'm trying to focus, or five seconds even. Right. Yeah, when I'm trying to focus. And so then what I'm wearing probably a full cap or something close, like I'm wearing a lot of electrodes probably. Maybe, but not necessarily. So yeah. um, certain things are measurable with increasingly more miniaturized devices. Um, so for instance, measuring um, a rough analog of someone's attention is possible with, you know, as little as, you know, one or two sensors. Because you're only on like prefrontal. Because the activity, well, it's where the, where it's placed is one aspect of it, but also because the type of signal that's related to attention is a, is a mm. pretty large signal that's mm. pretty well measurable uh, through EEG. And of course, I have to be, I have to sort of qualify that by saying that we don't have a definition of attention that we're all agreeing on here. So I'm using attention very loosely here. Um, there are forms yeah. of attention, like spatial attention, that I, you know, like are you attending to that point in space or that point that I'm not going to be able to measure with that one sensor. But in terms of like, am I cognitively focused or not, that's something that you can measure using a pretty low number of sensors if you deal with the noise appropriately um, to some degree of reliability that is useful. Um, and, uh, and so you don't necessarily need a large number of sensors to get something useful out. And even better, if you can probe the brain, like I can have you do a five minute task where I'm probing the brain no, and measuring the response of the brain yes, in yes. that task, yes. I can extract even more information with an even lower uh, uh, channel count or lower dimensional, we call it sensor, you know, lower number of sensors, um, and still get a highly meaningful result out. Nice, and then it, that makes sense. And then if you also have the task be a, 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 a measurement of maybe their baseline, and then you can then work with the company to do an activity that's right. The baseline. So that's one possibility is you can have an intervention or a boost or something. And that boost could be, you know, stimulating your brain, doing an activity, meditating if you're trying to, say, reduce your stress. Mm -hmm. um, one of many different kinds of interventions. But the key is you want to then measure what the effect of the intervention was. So let's say I'm trying to do something here where um, my goal is to um, uh, improve your attention. Okay, and while you're focused on a particular type of task. And I do that by stimulating a particular part of the prefrontal cortex, okay? So you put on a device, you stimulate the brain, and then you do a quick five minute task. And now I measure the response of your brain in that task. Now I wanna know, when I stimulated your brain, did I improve the response in your brain? Did I improve, did I change brain activity in a way that indicates that I'm improving brain function? And then if I didn't, then I want to modify my stimulator to target it in a different way to create the desired effect that actually has an impact on the brain. And so that cycle of measuring, predicting, and intervening, changing the state, and then measuring the effect of the intervention, yeah. that whole cycle, that's something that, uh, that we help to make very, well, I wouldn't say very easy, but much easier to do um, than if you were to try to build that whole analysis pipeline and, and, and framework for both uh, doing yeah. the prediction yeah. and oh, the assessment. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So now companies can come in with just the intention to have activities mm -hmm. uh, and then use your um, infrastructure to process the data. And exactly, like to figure out did that activity have an effect on the brain in these particular ways that we're interested in looking at. Did it, improve, did it change activity in parts of the brain that are related to attention, let's say. Yes, no, yes, good. And for that person, we have the right intervention. You know, no, then let's try a different intervention. Yep. And the key is being able to iterate rapidly in that space. So the key to all innovation is failing many times. We forget that failure is the path to success. And we have to fail early and fail quick. And in order to do that, we need to not expend a ton of resources on a problem only to find that it was the wrong question we were asking, right? Yeah, yeah. And how many of us oh, have yeah. all like embarked on a great ambitious project and dedicated a year of our lives or yeah, months yeah. or weeks only to find, ah, oh, there's nothing there, <laughs> you know? As scientists, we encounter that all the time. But I think all of us in some senses encounter that in every creative project we do, any product you're building, you think you have the right market fit, well, you want to find out, like, really early, is my, is my product going to have the desired effect, you know, that I want as early as possible so that you can iterate and iterate and iterate until you go out with your product and hit the market. 
So again, that's an area that we feel uh, you know, is really important. It's one that we're really committed to helping shorten that, that cost and time to do all of that signal analysis and processing. So you can get an answer to your question really quickly. Um, you know, is my device having the impact I want? Am I measuring something useful? You know. In in neuroscience, if you make that mistake, it's it, it's a comp it's a really complicated place to to make that mistake to make a mistake. Yeah, Cause it can be because it's hard to see like where was my you know where was the mistake in that. That's in a that lot pipeline. of time that you were taking mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, and, yeah. exactly. So then, but, d yeah, yeah, I, and then I, I want to ask this question as well. It's where within your data or your machine learning algorithms, where is the biggest hole in the data set for now? Like where's the least amount of data about the brain and where is the, the most amount of data that you have on the brain? As hmm. much as you can share. It's a good question. Um, so from non-invasive sensors like EEG, um, we have quite a lot of actually laboratory grade data. Data collected from people sitting down in an environment where you're having them do a particular task and you've mm -hmm. constrained it and isolated them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know a lot about, for instance, how the visual system processes targets. Like when you are looking for something like a Where's Waldo and you find Waldo, yeah. like we, mm -hmm. can we can predict, we can detect when your brain finds Waldo. Like as fast as your brain is actually consciously finding, finding Waldo, Waldo, you know, yeah. like as it's as the neural the, actually, there's a, there's a signature of that even if you're not consciously aware of having found Waldo, you know, it happens fast and even before the conscious awareness you happens see, or as it's happening. Yes, it's so like we a, can decode that it's very like a very quickly. Couple hundred milliseconds yes, exactly, or something beforehand. Exactly. It's About crazy. 300, 250 or so. That's so nuts that that when I. As I find Waldo, you see that I found Waldo, right. and then I become aware. Right. It's so interesting. Or another example is making errors when you're making mistakes, right? Let's say I'm, I'm, you're, you're doing a task, a simple task where you have to, you know, press a left button or a right button at a particular point in time. Yeah, this is an interesting. Okay, one. it's a simple yeah. type of task, yeah. although like a flanker task. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but essentially it comes down to making a choice between two buttons. Two you buttons. Know? Press the launch button or the not launch button, sure. you know, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you press the wrong button, um, some percentage of the time you will become consciously aware of having made that mistake. But well before that actually happens, or even if you don't become consciously aware, the brain knows that you pressed the wrong button. And when it knows, it generates a signal that is sort of a signal to the rest of the brain, like a reinforcement learning signal saying, we think at least, saying, hey, whatever you did there was the wrong thing, okay? So don't do it again. Whoa. Now that signal we can measure faster than you can correct your mistake. Yeah. Um, which yeah. means that if you're auto typing and you, you know, fat finger the button or whatever, you know, yeah. which I do all the time. Yeah, me too. You know, then in theory with one of these sensors actually in practice, you could autocorrect um, that mistake. And so that's an, that's an example of, of an area where yeah. we have a lot of knowledge, a lot of data around these kinds of, 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 uh, you know, of paradigms and of systems, and we can do pretty good in de at decoding those kinds of states. Areas where, it's, where we need a lot more data are, are multifold, but at least in a few key areas. One is getting data outside the lab. So when I sit you down in a room and I probe your brain, <laughs> I'm, seeing, I'm seeing your brain in, in that context. This is not your brain when you're out with your friends, when yeah. you're at home, when you're exercising. driving in your car, mm -hmm. right, exercising. Um, the brain is adaptive. Having a eureka moment, like a genius mm -hmm. moment of some sort. Yeah, yeah, right. And so the context of your environment changes your brain and how your brain behaves. And even the signatures in your brain that might indicate that you found Waldo will be different than the signatures that indicate you found the dress that you were looking for in the shopping, you know, while you're walk walking through Macy's or, the, uh, or that, you, you know, uh, that you spotted your friend across the room, right? Although there will be some similarities, there's differences. So we need more and more data mm -hmm. out there in the wild, I call it, or we call it, mm -hmm. you know, the wild mm -hmm. of the world, yeah. which yeah, is yeah. not the lab. Not the lab, yeah. So yeah. one of the key things is, is, is making the world the laboratory where yes, you put yes. biosensors on people 
and they can just go out about their daily lives and we record data and try to understand how their brain is relating to the things they're looking at and engaging with and seeing and then building machine learning models that ultimately can make sense of that kind of data. So that's another challenge. This is why I want to put EEGs on the heads of the six artists that go with Yusaka to the Oh, yes, exactly. The overview effect. The yeah. overview, yeah. yeah. Um, really that would be fantastic. That. It would be data. great to, to uh, you know, we're, co we're collaborating with, with um, the Human Space Flight Laboratory right now in North Dakota, hopefully trying to help build some sensing technology that could help with long duration deep space exploration for NASA, getting us to hopefully mm -hmm. uh, uh, extend the duration of these missions to Mars and the moon and stuff. And I'm a huge proponent of neurotech um, in space and how uh, important it is that we have to also measure how the brain is changing when you're up there in space. Yeah. Well, well, you're talking about something a little different, which is what's the experience that the person's feeling? The artist will convey that. Yeah. But what if, you know, what if we could, what if we could see inside their minds? Oh. Now, we're not there yet. <laughs> EEG won't give you a window that is crystal clear into that person's mind. No, yeah, cool. never gonna happen with EEG, but we yeah. might be able to see something cool uh, yeah. from that. Um, yeah. And uh, who knows, maybe decades from now, that data that's collected will we'll find the needle in the haystack yeah. that we can't find now, you know. So what's going on with all of the giants, the kernel and the Neuralink? Um, there seems to be a, well, there's a lot of AI safety and security researchers and, but geopolitical pressures are like, be the first ones, collect all the data, make the biggest moves, don't worry so much about ethical considerations, which is making it difficult to have those hard conversations. Yeah, so the future of neurotechnology, um, I think is, um, is a story of exponential growth that we are at the very beginning of. Super beginning. Right? Yeah. Okay, so it's important first to understand that because yeah. um, an exponential trend starts out looking very flat. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And even in the beginning of it, it looks linear. <laughs> yes. But the thing about exponential trends is they change very, very quickly. Yeah. And we're right now entering into that, that upswing. Um, and it's been happening for a few decades. Um, on the other hand, the fact that we can see what the trend might looks like means that we often have a tendency to sort of maybe prognosticate in a way that where we think, oh, it's going to be 10 years and we're all going to be walking around with implants in our brains and we're all going to have the ability to communicate through telepathy, uh, you know, in 15 years and, you know, and, and so, uh, the, we have to be a little bit conservative when we think about where the technology is and also how quickly it can be adopted. Um, out there in the world. So what Kernel and Neuralink are doing is they're working primarily in the space of invasive technology implants, um, which ideally um, would not require a surgery. Um, ideally, there are different ways of, of recording signals inside the brain now through, for instance, putting um, up your vein, you can snake up a, a, a very, very thin wire and record activity inside your brain. Damn. It's called a stent trode. Stent trode. Stent trode. <laughs> it's actually because it's like a stent, stent. right? That's used for with you know cardiovascular. Trode at the yeah, bottom. Exactly with a trode. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> um, another just... technology that's made its rounds uh, is called neural dust. And yeah, this was neural developed dust. by Michael Maharbenes and Jose Carmena at UC Berkeley. Yep. Um, very cool technology. MEMS. Uh, well, really, this isn't quite yet MEMS, but, you know, very small uh, devices. Uh, of course, it uses MEMS technology, but very small devices um, that can record brain activity and uh, be wirelessly powered, actually powered through ultrasound, which is pretty cool, yeah. um, and can even potentially stimulate. Um, mm -hmm. So you can record and stimulate from these little, uh. teeny little uh, sensor stimulators that can be sprinkled, if you will, yeah. throughout the brain or across the, the brain, the surface of the brain. That technology is, is still um, also in its infancy, and um, they need to be, it needs to be miniaturized significantly from where it is yeah, yeah. to be the really truly dust-like, where yeah. you're just it's invisible stuff sprinkled throughout your brain. Um, but someday that kind of technology might be the future of neural interfaces, um, and that future may not may be very well, very well in our lifetimes. Um, yeah. We will, you yeah. may have this in your head in your lifetime. Yeah. That is a possibility. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, when that happens is still the unknown. Um, so that's an area, those kinds of things are the kinds of things that like say Kernel and Neuralink are, are looking at and, and other things in that space. Um, uh, others are looking like Mary Lou Jepsen with open water mm -hmm. is looking at uh, you know uh, optical tomographic imaging approaches mm -hmm. you know using light basically to image the brain mm -hmm. um, and so that's a potentially non-invasive way to to image the brain at higher resolutions and see what's going on in there um, there's again needs to we still need to see how that will be proven out uh, especially when you try to make a consumer device out of it uh, so it's one thing to do in a lab with a million dollar device and Another thing to make it something that's a little band-aid, uh, but that's the goal of, say, open water. And there's others who are also uh, pioneering in this space. It's a very exciting and fertile ground in which yeah. a lot of activity is happening, but it is still early days. Yeah. We, we at Intheon see many of these technologies as the future of sensing, mm -hmm. and we are laying the groundwork in our platform for these technologies. We actually just finished out a larger project um, to integrate uh, a large number of signal processing algorithms for processing implant data. So now we can process over 15 different uh, implantable file types and pull out spikes. And spikes are little discharges of a neuron, you know, mm -hmm. so we can process that kind of data too. So, you know, we, we think in, in 20 years when those devices hit the market, we'll be ready to decode the activity from those sensors too yeah. in the cloud and uh, connect your brain directly to, uh, to whatever. Um, device or application you wish to connect it to. Decoding neural dust. Decoding neural dust. Whoa. And that's going to require a lot of heavy lifting and processing because the amount of data you're going to be getting, if we it's think a it's lot. a lot from EEG, it's a lot. many, many orders of magnitude larger wow. when you're r recording from implants. Um, yeah. yeah. Both in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the how frequently you're sampling data as well as how many sensors you have, you know, and how many different neurons you're recording from. I mean, there's, you know, 100 billion of them in there almost. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> what, now, wh where does one take Intheon next? What, is, what are you guys up to next? How, how, what, what, how many people do you guys have right now? We're a pretty small team. We've always been on, on the, right now, on, uh, you know, on the order of about 10 people yep. uh, full time. Yep. And then, uh, but uh, we hope to be growing a lot soon. Yeah. And we're doing some exciting things that I'll hope to be announcing soon. Okay, um, cool. Uh, but our focus right now is on this platform yeah. to empower and enable the community of, of uh, transformative technology folks, of people wanting to do more with their biosensor data, yeah. to really empower them to, to, uh, to find those killer apps and to get to that point very quickly where they can have a useful and impactful neurotechnology application that really has meaning. And we want to help you do all the heavy lifting through our platform, all that decoding and sensing. And so our future for Intheon is very much into growing this ecosystem, growing this platform. I just actually today gave a little preview of our new Neuroscale Insights uh, mm -hmm. service that will be fully launching in a couple months, but uh, we're now uh, accepting early previews into. Nice. And this is a whole system for being able to just record data, upload that data, apply a pipeline and get back all your processed results, statistical models, Whoa. BCI models, and also interactive reports uh, that are graphical that show you, you can interact with them, it shows you all your data, features, it shows you, you know, a lot of it, rich information about what was in your data, what's the quality of your data, what, what do your neural signals look like, what does your statistical model look like, you know, all through this interactive report, oh, right? And so, but the cool thing is that you can do this, if I was collecting data from you right now and I wanted to know, did the data set I just got, was it, was it good quality? Did I get the effect I wanted from you? Am I seeing that thing in the brain I'm looking for? I can know literally while you're still sitting there within like five, 10 minutes, of you having recorded that data, I can have what would take a, your research associate, you know, months to code up all the algorithms and then take the data and then run the statistical model and make the figures, all that stuff in your fingertips while you're still sitting there. And then I could say, oh, maybe I need to change my experiment. Hey, let me get another hour with you, you know. Um, but also this kind of application for insights can be really exciting and useful, I think, for um, for the, the for uh, uh, product focused uh, um, uh, uh, applications. For instance, um, one example is if I'm if I'm uh, I have a uh, a, um, a company that tries to optimize, say, human performance. You know, if I'm trying to optimize human performance, 
I want to know, did my intervention, the, my brain stimulation or whatever it is that I'm applying, did I get the effect I wanted? Well, our reporting system can tell you that very, very quickly from a person, you know, did that change in the brain that I was looking for happen when I stimulated the brain or when I did that thing? Um, and furthermore, it can be useful for you to have your own kind of quantified self-report that says, oh, here's how my brain activity is changing Correct. over time. So all yeah. of these applications yeah. of this, this new service that we're launching. I love that synthesis. Just the landing page that just makes me feel like I am deeply in tune and in touch with what exists up mm -hmm. here. Yeah, that, that that's a big, big part of it. Yeah, Absolutely. That we're properly crunching everything. Yeah. So, interesting. Now, I want to ask you this question. This is, this is pro probably a good one to ask you. Is consciousness localized in the body? That's a that's a, a that is a big question. So I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. But there's a lot of theories about where consciousness arises from. Um, some have argued that there is places like the claustrum. People, it was a popular place, you know, that people thought maybe this is the nexus where maybe some kind of interesting integration happens, which is necessary for consciousness. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, Descartes thought it was the, you know, the pineal gland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the reality is we don't know where the seat of consciousness is, is if there even is a single seat of consciousness. Mm -hmm. My personal theory is that, uh, or the one that I subscribe to, is that consciousness doesn't arise in any one place. Mm -hmm. It is a distributed phenomenon. Yeah. It arises through the interaction of many different subsystems of the brain communicating yeah. with each other and modeling each other. The brain modeling itself, it's like Indra's net, you know about Indra's mm -hmm. net, the mirrors that are all mm -hmm. infinitely reflecting themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the brain in some senses, when you look into the architecture of the brain, it has some of these kinds of properties where every part of the brain connected to many other parts of the brain is sort of creating its own model of what it thinks that part of the brain's input is and what it thinks that part of the brain is doing. So it's kind of like the auditory cortex having a version, its own version of what it thinks the visual cortex is from the auditory cortex perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. and vice versa, okay? Now out of this nexus may arise conscious experience, the, mm -hmm. the self-awareness that we, that we experience. And yeah, that requires certain areas. There are uh, necessary areas of the brain for us to be conscious, um, that if you remove those parts of the brain, you are not conscious. But it, you know, that doesn't mean that those are the seats of consciousness, right? And so um, I think the, the big question for, for consciousness research, um, both up until now and in, for the next 100 years, is to try to look deeper and deeper into the brain and find those areas of the brain that are not only uh, you know, necessary but also sufficient, or both sufficient and necessary for consciousness. And then try to, from that, gain a, a clearer theory of, uh, of where consciousness truly arises. Um, what about outside of the vehicle? as a soul or what that's that's a very interesting that, that then then we, we 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 border on the metaphysical totally. at some point yeah. potentially um, and I think that is also an area where one must depart from you know from science because science is not a, is only a tool for um, being able to explain things using observation and so the yeah. soul if I cannot observe it then I cannot use scientific methods to test for its existence for now for now yeah. unless you find a way to observe the soul so who knows yeah. Yeah. I don't know but I, I personally believe that um, where we should focus our attention scientifically is on the questions that we can falsifiably develop a falsifiable hypothesis around. In other words, I can develop a hypothesis mm -hmm. that I can test the truth or falsity yes, of because yes. I have the tools to do it. Yes. And if we focus our attention scientifically there, then we'll make a lot of progress. The other areas are areas that we absolutely should continue to explore and discuss and debate. So for instance, you know, the question of where is the soul? Is there a soul? That, where does it reside? Um, that's a question that, uh, that absolutely uh, is deserving of discussion and discourse. Um, but science isn't really the right tool, I think, yet to answer that particular question. Um, because we don't have the, the observational tools that would allow us, I think, to gain that particular insight. But yeah. that said, you raised actually what, what you said though that was interesting is, is this notion, may consciousness um, uh, live outside the body or outside the brain? And I want to posit this other idea that um, consciousness 
does not actually exist in your brain solely. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is a distributed phenomenon mm. that also exists in the minds of others yes, in the environment the around us. Totally. And we actually <coughs> offload our consciousness and cognition constantly into the devices that we interact with and into other people by interacting with them. You have a memory of me, for instance. Definitely. Your memory of me, totally. the interaction between us means that to some extent, the information that is part of my conscious self-awareness is also Im to some extent imputed into yeah, your system, yeah, right? Exactly. And then comes and feeds back into me when we interact. That's and that so, collective consciousness. It, yeah, right? and so there's these interesting patterns of, of loops. Inside my brain, I have these areas of the brain talking to each other, you yeah. know, and out of that emergent conscious, but then we're all networked together as a society as well, you know, through our interactions with mm -hmm, each other mm -hmm. and, and also with the world around us that we interact with. And some of our consciousness and cognition may actually reside there to some extent. I yeah. don't really mean this metaphysically, although totally. it could be that if you're a property dualist, you may actually think that consciousness is in everything, you know. Um, but I, I mean this more in a, in a, in a kind of complex systems way, <laughs> yeah. that that consciousness may extend outside ourselves. So to understand consciousness, we need to not just understand the brain, but we need to understand the context in which somebody's acting. We need to understand the relationships with the people around them they interact with, exactly. the devices and things they exactly. interact with. Yeah, because yeah. then that's what actually ends up sculpting their architecture. And yeah, their exactly, and their thinking. Yeah. yeah. So. This is so awesome and so interestingly deep about the brain. And I'm, I'm just, I've, 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 I'm really happy to know someone that's taking the computational neuroscience approach, someone that's building out the, like, the AWS of, <laughs> of neural uh, processing. And that, that's fascinating. Like, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, we just want to help grow the field. And, you know, we all have these, I think, visions of what neurotechnology can do. And our goal is to help you realize yours, basically. We want to make it possible for your vision of what neurotechnology can do for humanity possible. Yeah. And to get there as fast as possible. And as with, with as reliable and scientifically validated an approach as possible, because yeah. that's key too, you know? Yes, yes. You gotta do it the right way, start with good tools. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, this, is, this has been a huge pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, real pleasure to be here. It, I, I, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to some, some of your comments about this episode, because this has been, thanks for tuning in. This has been such a, it's a totally, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a computational neuroscience marketplace tool set uh, building out the, the future of what we need to actually figure out what's going on in here in in a, in a software side of things and, yeah and that's and that's always um, refreshing to 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 hear about things that like can really scale and can really um, have people from around the world sending in data learning about different cultures and learning about different emotions and feelings there's so much to unpack and it's just part one you know there's so much more left we got to get you into um, into the brain mind ecosystem um, there's a lot of really fun ecosystems. Do you know Vivian Ming over at Berkeley? Um, I, I know of, and we've been connected, um, but we have not. Uh, we have not spent time. Yeah, I, 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 she's the one that taught me like four years ago. She taught me about maximizing human potential, and yeah, and she got me hooked. And I so was many like, opportunities for uh, uh, for that for for taking us from where we are now to the next level. Yeah. You know, if there's if you know if there's a, a civilizations have potentially scales, you know, 10, 10 levels for, you know, for a civilization. We're on level zero. I want to see us at level one. Exactly. You know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> like a bunch What's of, that going to look like? A bunch of five and eight year olds <laughs> running around right now, Earth, because we don't have the proper stewardship. Yeah, mm -hmm. yet. We're going to develop that out. Um, <laughs> well, it's important to build things like stewardship into our our technological growth system. Yeah, so and education. And being, yes, and being, being conscious skills. about that as we're developing the technology, being aware of what its implications are, and, and, and building in principles of stewardship into the, into the technological growth process so that the technology is inherently yeah. for good. You know, and that way, the kids starts from a good raised. seed, it will, it will grow into a Groove. beautiful tree that will, will be good for everybody. So. Yeah, yes. Yeah, everyone, please go check out the link in the bio. Um, and also check out, um, ch ch check out, check out what you, you know, what, what you, with what you've learned, go and build, go and manifest your dreams into the world, go and execute. 
And much love, everyone. We will see you soon. Peace. Thank you.